antimicrobial compounds. I like to start off with four definitions, the first of which is bactericidal compounds that kill bacteria, as the name suggests. So the prefix bacteria refers to bacteria, and cidal in the suffix refers to killing. So we can modify this term to be virucidal, for example, and then it would say kill viruses. So the second term it gives you a different version of the suffix, static. In that particular case, um, a bacteriostatic compound is one that slows or inhibits growth of bacteria. This could be fungistatic. It could be, a, in that case, a drug that is an inhibitor of fungi like yeasts or molds. An antiseptic is an antimicrobial compound that can be applied to skin or mucous membrane, so it's not um, quite as harsh as a disinfectant, which is applied to inanimate objects and surfaces. So an antiseptic might be like Listerine that you could actually gargle with or hydrogen peroxide that you could pour directly in a cut. Whereas a disinfectant is one that, um, you know, like bleach or ammonia that you would put on, you would mop a floor with or wipe down a countertop with, but you wouldn't gargle with. <laughs> Antibiotics are natural substances produced by microorganisms. Um, so pen, the penicillium mold produces penicillin and that's an antibiotic. Chemotherapeutic agents, conversely, are, are chemically synthesized. Usually they're compounds that are um, based off of the molecular structure of an actual antibiotic, but again, they're, they're not natural. They're synthesized in the lab. Selective toxicity is a really important term, and this is uh, one that, you know, it, it, the pharmaceutical companies pay close attention to. It's, it's basically a reference to agents that inhibit or kill bacterial or microbial pathogens or cancer or whatever it is, but have little or no toxic effect on the host. And that's an ideal circumstance. You want high selective toxicity, meaning you want a drug that selectively does what you want it to do and minimizes collateral damage. Broad spectrum drugs are typically used to inhibit a wide range of microorganisms, and then they're often indicated when the cause of the disease is unknown. So if an individual is experiencing septic shock, and, and the odds are the infection is polymicrobial with lots of different things growing in the blood, then a broad spectrum antibiotic would be indicated. A narrow spectrum um, antibiotic, conversely, is one that's effective against a limited range of microbes, or even a specific microbe. Um, it's often recommended when the cause of a disease is known. And again, the purpose of that is to sort of limit the amount of extra microbes that you kill. So obviously you don't want to um, wipe out the gut tract microbes, the good microbes in your gut tract, for example. That could cause even more problems than the original infection. This table is a nice overview of, of the classes of antibiotics. And the, um, you know again, giving you an example of the type Antibi this, the prototype antibiotic, the source that it comes from, the spectrum, and the mode of action. So for exam questions, I would want you to know class, um, um, examples, and mode of action primarily. It's good to know this other information too, but it's but uh, not as important. So beta-lactam antibiotics such as penicillin inhibit steps in cell wall or peptidoglycan synthesis. Aminoglycosides like streptomycin inhibit protein synthesis or translation. Glycopeptides like vancomycin also inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis like penicillins, but the mechanism of action is slightly different, even though the end result of, of um, mucking up peptidoglycan synthesis is similar. Macrolides like erythromycin and also protein synthesis inhibitors and tetracyclines, such as tetracycline, <laughs> are um, translation inhibitors as well. And then lastly, the polypeptides, such as polymyxin and bacitracin. These guys are often compounded in creams and stuff and sold over the counter as topicals. Our um, cytoplasmic membrane and peptidoglycan synthesis assembly inhibitors. So this picture shows you the structure of a couple beta-lactam antibiotics, penicillin and cephalosporin. And here in the center, this blue box indicates the beta-lactam ring that gives these molecules their uh, group name. There's a couple different types of peptidoglycan synthesis inhibitors, bacitracin being one, penicillin-type antibiotics being another, and then the glycopeptides. And this animation shows you the mechanism of action of a couple of these. The um, uh, bacitracin, which is a typical over-the-counter um, 
type drug that's often formulated in, uh, as a topical cream. Its mechanism of action is to interfere with pyrophosphatase, and pyrophosphatase is essential for um, breaking this the phosphodiester linkage between these two phosphates and bactoprenol. So bactoprenol as a diphosphate is not functional, but as a monophosphate is functional, and its role is to bind to peptidoglycan monomers in the cytoplasmic side of the cell. And so once this happens, the peptidoglycan monomer, once bounded back to pranol, can be brought over into the periplasm, essentially, where the peptidoglycan is being synthesized during growth. <clears throat> the bacitracin, however, will interfere with pyrophosphatase activity, leaving the phosphodiester bond intact on the bactoprenol molecule. And so as a result, bactoprenol moves to the cytoplasmic side, but, but is unable to bind to, but is unable to bind to the peptidoglycan monomer as a diphosphate, and therefore can't bring it over and cannot add it to the growing peptidoglycan chain. This image shows you um, the peptidoglycan as it's being as it's assembled and being cross-linked. And, and in this particular case shows you the mechanism of action of vancomycin, which is a glycopeptide type antibiotic. So the we have repeating N-acetylmuramic acid, N-acetylglucosamine residues that are glyc uh, that are linked by a glycosidic linkage. And with each, each NAM has a pentapeptide side chain in its original formation, in the early formation, but eventually these terminal alanines will be removed and a, and a linkage will be formed between the alanine and the DAP that you see here. Vancomycin sits right here on these terminal alanines and prevents that from happening. So that's illustrated here. So again, the vancomycin sits on the terminal alanines and prevents this, the, um, the formation of DAP um, ala linkage. The next, the next um, sequence will show you the mechanism of action of penicillin. Now, penicillin has essentially the same outcome in that it prevents the formation of that aladap linkage. And as a result, the microbe will have a weak cell wall that's not cross-linked, and therefore the microbe is susceptible to osmotic lysis. So here's transpeptidase, the enzyme that removes the terminal alanine and forms that, that bond between ala and DAP, as indicated here. And so again, there's the bond, and then the alanine goes away. Now, when we add penicillin into the mixture, penicillin will bind to the transpeptidase and block that linkage, and it will also block the release of alanine from the pentapeptide. And you can imagine then how a microbe might become resistant to penicillin by modifying the transpeptidase so that it no longer binds to penicillin, but still performs this vital function as it's growing. And that's what's pictured in this um, video here is that as these growing E. coli cells, I'm sorry, as these growing um, bacillus cells are, are um, experiencing um, log phase, they reach a critical length and they can't sustain and they blow up. And you can see that in the presence of penicillin. So translation inhibitors <clears throat> include the uh, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, and acrylide type antibiotics. And so these guys, oops, There's a couple versions of these guys, and so you can see here's the you know the basics of um, prokaryotic translation, beginning with the ribosome. They have a 50s large ribosome and a 30s small ribosomal subunit, and so the, the initiator um, tRNA is a 4-mil methionine. So here's the methionine and the tRNA that brings the methionine. Here's the messenger RNA that encodes protein in the bacteria, and the first codon encodes the thionine. And so that assembly takes place, and now you have the um, A site is available to receive the next amino acid, 
and then this gets transferred to that, to the amino, new incoming amino acid, and you start forming a chain. But in this particular case, you can see that an aminoglycoside like streptomycin binds to the 30S ribosomal subunit here, causes a deformation, oops, causes a deformation of the, um, um, of the uh, 30S ribosomal subunit, and so that after a period of time, the incoming ribosomes can't, I'm sorry, the incoming transfer RNAs can't bind. Tetracyclines do essentially the same thing, where they're binding again to the, um, to the small ribosomal subunit, inhibiting the uh, amino acyl tRNAs from, from, from coming into the A site. And then lastly, the, the macrolides um, <clears throat> interfere with the large ribosomal subunit. And so in this particular case, the, ma the macrolide, like erythromycin, binds to the 50S ribosomal subunit to prevent any further elongation of the, of the chain. And so that, the, the, uh, that causes the uh, chain termination to happen prematurely. So this amino acid, in order to make a functional protein, needs additional amino acids added to it. But with this I mean, erythromycin bound to the ribosome, that can't happen. So you get these weird truncated proteins that aren't functional. And especially, it's especially important if these truncated proteins actually are vital to the livelihood of the cell. And so again, the, the, the um, antibiotic will kill the bacteria if, if enough of these truncated proteins um, are, are made and interfere with the growth of the microbe. So another, other targets include um, RNA and DNA synthesis. And so this is an example of an RNA synthesis inhibitor, rifampin, which inhibits bacterial RNA polymerase, specifically binds to the beta subunit of the RNA polymerase. And so here's the core enzyme of, of prokaryotes, core RNA polymerase enzyme of prokaryotes, and here's the um, sigma subunit. So these, these subunits, these um, five subunits come together to make the functional RNA polymerase. Rifampin will bind to the beta subunit and block its ability to interact with DNA so that transcription can't take place. Microbes that are um, resistant to this drug then can modify this particular um, position on their beta subunit and allow transcription to continue to take place. Another version of uh, targets are um, illustrated here with cotrimoxazole. It's a combination drug that's used to inhibit folic acid synthesis. And folic acid is essential for nucleic acids and F-MET synthesis. I've already shown you what F-MET is. The, excuse me. The, um, um, the, the first amino acid added to prokaryotic um, protein synthesis. Cotrimoxazole is often used for urinary tract infections. But anyway, this is, this is a combination drug that interferes with metabolism, essentially. And so here is the, the first drug is a sulfonamide type drug that interferes with dihydroteroate synthase. Um, and this, this, drug, um, this drug mimics paraminobenzoic acid. So in this folic acid synthesis system, dihydroteroate diphosphate and PABA, as we abbreviate it, come together and are transformed into various iterations to ulti ultimately make tetrahydrofolic acid. And then tetrahydrofolic acid can then be used for nucleic acid synthesis. The sulfonamides look very much like PABA, and so they interfere with this enzyme. The enzyme wants to grab onto sulfonamides more so than PABA, <clears throat> and as a result, they, it, this, this enzyme gets, gets um, distracted, essentially, <laughs> and, and from, from doing its downstream job on PABA. But to make this a more complete enzyme, uh, drug combination, trimethoprim is also added, which hits another enzyme lower in the uh, metabolic pathway. So in this case, dihydrofolate reductase. <clears throat> and so this combination minimizes the amount of um, antibiotic resistance that can take place because the micro would actually have to mutate both of these enzymes in order to survive uh, treatment with cotrimoxazole. <clears throat> Bacterial resistance to beta-lactam type antibiotics um, typically occurs in a few different ways, one of which is the microbes just outright produce beta-lactamase enzymes. So beta-lactamase is an enzyme that breaks open 
the beta-lactam ring in these beta-lactam type antibiotics. And so you can see that opened up ring here. And as a result, that beta-lactamase no longer um, makes this um, penicillin type drug inactive. It no longer can bind to the transpeptidase that I showed you in that video. Another, um, <clears throat> here's a clavulanic acid, which I will show you its, its function in a minute. Um, another version of resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics is modification of the target. So the microbe, instead of, or instead of or in addition to coming up with a beta-lactamase enzyme or acquiring the gene for that production, the microbes can simply just modify the target. In this particular case, they modify the transpeptidase. So penicillin comes in, doesn't recognize this modified pep transpeptidase, and therefore the drug, um, the uh, um, drug doesn't doesn't function. So here's where clavulanic acid comes in. So you can see again, just comparing these things, clavulanic acid is a um, a molecule that has the beta lactam ring, but doesn't bind to um, transpeptidase because presumably because of this, these functional groups don't allow it to. And so we use clavulanic acid in a clinical situation as indicated in this um, diagram. So, and one of the common examples of that is Augmentin. I don't know if any of you have ever taken, taken Augmentin often for a, ear infections and things like that, but this is a combination drug with a, with a beta-lactam that mimics penicillin and um, clavulanic acid. And so, <clears throat> This is what we hope happens. You treat microbes with a beta, you treat an infection with a beta lactam type drug, you get killing, and everybody's happy. What often happens though is um, you treat an infection with beta lactam, the microbe produces a beta lactamase, the beta lactam antibiotic is, inact is inactivated, and the bacteria keep growing, and eventually bad outcomes happen. So, what we do as a counterattack is we treat with beta-lactam in combination with clavulanic acid. So if the microbe produces beta-lactamase, the clavulanic acid will inactivate the beta-lactamase, and that allows the beta-lactam to then be unaffected and kill the bacteria. It's essentially like you know in a football game, you've got a, a you know offensive lineman. You send the offensive lineman through to plow out the linebacker, and then the, the running back can, can get through. Mechanisms of resistance to aminoglycosides and chloramphenicol can also be modification. So I've, I've shown you that microbes can outright destroy an, um, antibiotics by producing things like beta-lactamase. I've shown you that microbes can modify the targets, so the penicillin, the transpeptidase, for example, or penicillin binding protein, can be modified so that, the, so that drugs don't recognize it. The microbe can even change the way the ribosomes look to avoid macrolides and drugs like that, the translation inhibitors, which they do very frequently. They modify the ribosomes so that the drugs don't bind to them anymore. But this is a subtle variation of that theme where they can modify, not outright destroy, just modify the drugs. And so here's, a, <clears throat> here's an example of a, of a chemical structure and some different places in which microbes can add um, functional groups or, or modify the functional groups. And so here's a in this particular case, the uh, um, <clears throat> you know A is in you know the mi microbes can can add an acetyl group, for example, to that particular location. Or in th this particular hydroxyl can be um, adenylated or phosphorylated by the microbe. So here's a more specific example in which you know chloramphenicol is a drug we often use. And, and microbes can develop the cat gene, or not develop it out of nowhere, out of thin air. They, they share it with each other through um, horizontal gene transfer and plasmids and so forth. But microbes that can acquire this particular gene called chloramphenicol transacetylase, and that drug will actually add acetyl groups to these key hydroxyls in the chloramphenicol molecule. And as a result, chloramphenicol will no longer be able to bind to ribosomes once these hydroxyls have been ac acetylated. So just these are just some examples if you wanted to see what an acetyl group looks like or <laughs> just to remind you of some general chemistry. This is another example of how microbes in sophisticated ways can become resistant to drugs. 
And this is a two-component system um, in Enterococcus species that confers vancomycin or glycopeptide resistance. I already showed you that vancomycin binds to the terminal alanines in growing polype I'm sorry, peptidoglycan. And by binding to those terminal alanines, prevents transpeptidase from making that bond between DAP and ALA. To, perform, to provide a strong peptidoglycan. So what this is two-component system is, is a, is a sensor that exists in the cytoplasmic membrane of the bacteria called van S. So imagine the cytoplasmic membrane here, and the microbe has this sensor protein. And then in the cytoplasm would be this um, other, this so-called response regulator. So the sensor kinase is van S. And then the second component, van R, is the response regulator. And this guy would be in the cytoplasm. And so <clears throat> van S would be basically sensitive to levels of vancomycin in the environment. And so the outside signal, in this particular case, um, sublethal levels of vancomycin, could, would interact with this, this sensor kinase, causing it to autophosphorylate. Then the van S would transfer its phosphate to van R. And van R phosphate, the response regulator, would become active and would sit on promoters to activate expression of genes for resistance to vancomycin. In this particular case, it's the van operon, consisting of contiguous genes van H, van A, and van X. Um, van, a, van H converts pyruvate to D-lactate. Um, van A binds um, d to d lactate and Van-X cleaves the terminal alanines. So in this particular case, the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the drug, oops. So in this particular case, the drug, I'll go back a little bit. In this particular case, the drug actually replaces this terminal alanine with a lac, lactate. And so as a result, the transpeptidase doesn't recognize it. And so the transpeptidase, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the trans the, uh, the drug vancomycin doesn't recognize it. Scratch that. So you see how this, so we'll go back a little bit and I'll show you that. So in this particular case, if th th this terminal alanine here is, is transformed into a um, um, diala, D lack, and so as a result of that, the van vancomycin can't bind there, and so that allows transpeptidase to just go in and do its job. <laughs> so that's basically what it's doing. It's covering up. Uh, it's changing. It's modifying the target for vancomycin so that vancomycin can't recognize the ala lac um, uh, modified modified peptoglycan. Another version of antibiotic resistance is illustrated here with tetracycline resistance. And so in this particular case, tetracycline in the environment can freely move through the cytoplasmic membrane. It's a hydrophobic molecule, can passively diffuse into and out of the cell. In the presence of magnesium ions, um, the um, tetracycline can, in this particular case, activate the system. So the way the system works is you've got TED-R, which is a repressor. TED-O is a series of uh, binding sites between the genes that where, where repressors can bind. And TED-A encodes a efflux pump. So TED-R, in the absence of tetracycline, gets formed, sits on the operator region here, and shuts down TED-A production meaning that the bacteria don't need to make this waste energy making this protein if there's no tetracycline around. But in the presence of tetracycline, tetracycline comes in, interacts with magnesium ions, and becomes active. And then in this active form of tet-magnesium complex, binds to the um, TET-R repressor that's sitting on this operator here, TET-O, and makes it fall off. So that TET-A can now be expressed and make this efflux pump. And so this is a, a proton antiporter. <laughs> so that means that if protons in the periplasm can be exchanged 
for the tetracycline that's building up in the cytoplasm and kicked out. The tetra this tetracycline can be kicked out. So it's imagine you're sitting in the middle of the ocean in a little boat and it's taking on water. The first thing you're going to do is want to try to bail that water out so that you stay afloat. <laughs> and that's what the microbes are doing here. The problem is it takes energy in the form of proton motive force because the microbe would love to use this proton to make energy through an ATPase or would love to use this proton to power flagella, but it can't. It's got to survive. So it's got to use that proton to kick out the tetracycline. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not a freebie. The microbe still is, is, is being taxed by the presence of the drug, but it's better than dying. So now the tetracycline is kicked out into the environment, and it's not available to build up in the cytoplasm and bind to ribosomes. So here's a summary of the resistance mechanisms that I've talked about. And a lot of these are coming on plasmids, these small extra chromosomal um, pieces of DNA that the microbes promiscuously swap around with each other. So <clears throat> one version of this is altered antibiotic targets. So the microbe can change its ribosomes or can change its transpeptidase, for example, or change the terminal alanines in the peptidoglycan so that the vancomycin can't bind, all those things. Altered antibiotic targets. Number two is an antibiotic degrading enzyme, so beta-lactamase. So a microbe can make a beta-lactamase and destroy penicillin-type antibiotics. The more subtle one is the antibiotic altering enzymes that they can acquire. And these just, again, cause minor modifications to the drug, like acetylations or whatever that allow the drug or disallow the drug to function. So I gave you that example of chloramphenicol trans acetylase for this um, mechanism. And then the last one is the, the, the efflux pump. So, for example, the TET, TET-A efflux pump. So again, the antibiotic can come in, but the microbe will immediately activate production of a pump that would then pump the drug out faster than it can come in.